everyone and welcome back to NeuroSciQ. Thanks for joining us again for another week of neuroscience videos. In today's video, we're going to expand on last week's video. If you recall last week's video, we discussed how cancer cells can form synaptic connections with resident neural cells in gliomas. So, with what we learned in last week's video, some questions come to mind. And these questions include whether or not this can provide us with early insights to synaptogenesis, whether or not this can help us to understand neurological disorders such as Alzheimer's disease or autism that manifest as circuit dysfunctions. It can also bring to mind the question of whether or not this can help us seal the gaps in understanding synapses and help us build knowledge on this topic to reduce the challenges that have impacted our attempts at developing regenerative medicines. So let's roll the intro and let's get started. Before we get started, I just want to talk about what synapses are. So, a little quick review. A synapse is a junction between two neurons. Not only can it be a junction between two neurons, it can also be a junction between a neuron and some sort of other tissue. So, this is the point of communication between a neuron and some sort of receiver cell. The way a synapse works is we have a postsynaptic cell that's receiving the messenger and a presynaptic cell, which is typically the neuron delivering the signal. What we have on the synapse are neurotransmitters that are being released from the presynaptic cell acting on receptors on the postsynaptic cell to deliver a message. So what are the neurotransmitters? The neurotransmitters are, maybe you want to think about them as letters being sent in the mail. They get released and then the receptors could be the mailbox that is receiving the message. Now synapses vary based on the receptors present and the neurotransmitters present and the way these develop all happens in the embryo. But overall the synapse is an important meeting place for intercellular communication and we talked about cellular communication again last week's video and so this type of signaling would be paracrine signaling because the cells are in close proximity to each other. Now synaptogenesis as I already mentioned a little earlier happens before birth making this inaccessible to study. So with that being said the initiating events that cause synaptogenesis are poorly understood. If you're interested in neurodevelopment, we do have another video about neurodevelopment that you can watch later that specifically focuses on neural migration. That's one of the things we understand a little better. We've already seen parallels between gliomas and normal neural cells. For instance, we've seen these parallels in the proliferative state of cancer cells, which is similar to the self-renewal states of normal neurons. Also, we've seen this in the invasive states of cancer cells, which is very similar to the migratory state of neuronal cells. So what we propose is that perhaps we can look at the synaptic integration of gliomas to study synaptogenesis. So if these are similar, they can really help us understand the mysterious events of synaptogenesis. Now, to touch on the electrical and synaptic integration of glioma into neural circuits, we turn to a paper by Venkatesh et al. Venkatesh and colleagues actually looked at glioma, and what they did was they took glioma cells and placed them on the hippocampus of rats, and what they did was use patch clamping to study the excitatory patterns of these gliomas. What they saw was that there were excitatory postsynaptic potentials in the patch clamp experiment. And interestingly, these EPSPs were mediated by AMPA receptors. And so by introducing an antagonist, which we've talked about plenty of times, an antagonist again blocks the receptor. So by introducing an antagonist for AMPA receptors, these EPSPs were eliminated. So that experiment was done as sort of a follow-up to the Vanktesh paper. What we wish to look into is if neuroscience can help us understand glioma biology, 
can glioma biology help us understand neuroscience? So where are we going with this? Perhaps by looking into the way gliomas form these synapses, we can unravel some of the mechanisms for synaptogenesis. The way we hope to do this is by drawing parallels between tumors and biology. This has been successful in the past. For instance, we have built an understanding of lots of fundamental physiological processes from studying cancer. One example is angiogenesis. We talked about angiogenesis in last week's video, and this is the formation of new blood vessels. Angiogenesis happens in cancer, which allows the tumors to grow and proliferate because by growing new blood vessels, we can allow delivery of nutrients and oxygen to the cells that need it. So by looking into the way cancer works, we were able to identify components that were characterized in tumors that helped us understand how angiogenesis happens. Also from studying cancer, we've developed an understanding of tumor suppressor genes and oncogenes. And these genes aren't only important in cancer, they are very important for normal cellular functioning and normal development. Also, another thing we've learned from cancer is about ferropoptosis. This is cellular death triggered by iron. It was discovered in cancer and it's now showing to be important in Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. So by looking into how cancer works, we're hoping to find answers to fill in our gaps in knowledge. Specifically, we're hoping to find the molecular machinery that drives the formation of new synapses. Because we still don't know the molecules and signals that initiate this process. So what have we been doing so far to study synaptogenesis? So far we've been looking at artificial synapse formation assays. Artificial synapse formation assays are co-cultures of neuronal and non-neuronal cells. And by looking at these co-cultures, we have been supplied with candidates for synaptogenesis. But the problem is there are too many candidates. Particularly, we have seen a high expression of CAM. Another method we've used to study synaptogenesis is knockout models. Now, after seeing that cellular adhesion molecules are important in synaptogenesis in the artificial synapse formation assays, knockout studies were done where cellular adhesion molecules were eliminated. However, deletion of the CAMs hasn't shown reduction in synaptic density. Another thing that has been done is transcriptomics of fetal tissue. Now this single cell analysis has issues. It has a somewhat shallow or medium sequencing depth, and there's low sensitivity to potentially critical but low abundant genes. So just because there isn't a lot of a gene present doesn't mean it isn't critical to the initiation of synaptogenesis. Also, with DNA, we can have alternative splicing. This can also lead to issues in identifying important genes for synaptogenesis. So why are gliomas promising? Gliomas are actively forming synapses, and so turning to them can help us to refine our knowledge as to what genes are important and nominate new candidates. We hope to be able to use gliomas to help us identify proteins that are important for synapse formation. So the goal is to refine. By combining what we've already done with this new approach, hopefully we'll be able to take the two groups of genes that come out of this research and come up with a subset from the overlap of both methods. This can help us to identify what is actually crucial for synaptogenesis. Also, the problem with looking at utero signals is that the adult nervous system may not be primed for these signals that the fetus is primed from. So, the benefit of looking into gliomas is that gliomas tend to form during mid to late adult life. And so if synaptogenesis is occurring in the adult brain, then perhaps this can help us develop more feasible therapies for disorders that surface later on in life. What we propose here at the Amandis lab is a new model for research. Perhaps by creating a co-culture of organoids with glioma precursors that appear to form synapses, we can 
create a humanoid 3D neural model to help study the mechanisms of early synaptogenesis. With this, we can look at both cell secreted molecules and cell surface molecules that are important to synaptogenesis. Overall, this exciting new discovery of the communication of gliomas with neurons through neural signals and the fact that these gliomas are forming synapses means that we have a new means of exploring synaptogenesis. So that's some food for thought for today and hopefully you're getting excited about this cancer neuroscience subfield. Again, the opportunities with neuroscience are endless and there will likely never be a time where there's something we can't learn about the human mind. Finally, I'd like to thank all the support that the Yamandis lab receives. I'd like to thank the Laboratory Medicine and Pathobiology program at the University of Toronto, as well as the Canadian Cancer Society. Also, we'd like to thank the Princess Margaret Cancer Foundation, the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research, and the Terry Fox New Investigator Awards program for the funding that went into this research. These are some of the ideas we're working on here in the Diamandis lab to help us leverage our understanding of the brain by using tumors. We hope to be able to update you in future years and we hope that we can improve all of our knowledge of the brain. Thank you for watching and we hope to see you next week.